This is another episode of the Money Button Invited Speaker Series. We have Daniel Krawitz with us. Daniel is a investor in Bitcoin and a self-taught economist who is an expert in uh, Austrian economics in particular. And this is the second video we're doing on the value of money. But this, the idea of this video is uh, more focused on Bitcoin itself. So this is really on the value of Bitcoin. We have an earlier video that we did a couple weeks ago, but that video is, is not strictly speaking a prerequisite to this one. So this video uh, should stand on its own uh, in discussing the, uh, the value of Bitcoin. Um, so Daniel, do you want to uh, uh, tell us, uh, tell us uh, what, what we're going to learn about uh, today? Yes. Well, thanks for inviting me again, and I'm glad people liked the first video. So in, in episode one, um, I talked a lot about uh, the context, and I talked about Austrian economics in general. So basically, uh, by the end of that video, we kind of got to the beginning of the value of money. So in this, this video, um, we're going to uh, apply the idea that we, we, we got to at the end of the last video. And uh, we talked about lots, lots of stuff before, um, and, but uh, you, you, don't, you don't need that, that to, um, to uh, get to our, uh, our jumping off point here if you, if you don't want to. So basically by, by the end of the last video, what, we said is that the value of money is future productivity. And the reason it, it took so long to get there is there, there's so many fallacies and uh, just so many, so many surrounding ideas that, that I wanted to get through. And um, remember, uh, there, there isn't, um, like I don't, have, uh, I don't have absolute proof that the Austrian theory is is the correct one. So, uh, if if you're watching, you should uh, you should be you, voracious in your uh, your in, ingestion of ideas. But this is this is the theory that I think is is the correct one. But uh, it's a, you have to um, you have to evaluate uh, lots of ideas, and the way that you the way that you succeed in investment is knowing knowing more than other people. So, um, uh, so just, just because somebody is, is uh, saying, saying what he thinks the, the value of money is, that doesn't, that it's a bad idea to just accept that without thinking about it, right? So anyway, um, uh, I'm gonna review a little bit. Um, so future, future productivity, uh, so when when um, er, earlier on I didn't use this phrase future productivity enough because um, I, I just didn't understand how much people were going to misunderstand what I was trying to say about money. So I and I th I think that this is this is the best way to say it. It's, fu it's future productivity and. That should be obvious because um, that's what you trade money for. So if there's no future productivity, there's no reason to have money. Um, and as, uh, as you pointed out in the last, uh, last video, in, in the end game for Bitcoin, there isn't, there isn't a price of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just what we use to um, to to state prices. So all prices are given in terms of Bitcoin, um, and uh, the the if, you, if the the value of Bitcoin is not it's not uh, measured in in terms of a price. It, it, instead, it's just everything that you can buy for Bitcoin. So what, what we want is for, for Bitcoin to become more valuable. And what that means is we want there to be a lot of future productivity in Bitcoin. 
So if we want to um, increase the value of Bitcoin, we, we create future productivity. And so here on this, this slide, what I've said is that there are, um, there are two reasons that Bitcoin can become more valuable. And one of them is a more future productivity, and the other is lower time preference, which means more future orientedness. So if people think more about the future, if they're more interested in the future, then they want a larger proportion of their portfolio to be in savings. And uh, what, what you get out of savings is uh, you benefit from an, an unknown future and you're kind of ready for anything. Whereas in, in contrast, if you have stocks, that means that um, you are benefiting from the productivity of a particular company or, or enterprise, but you are, you are, you're committed to that specific thing because there's always the possibility that it might go down before it goes up. So when you buy, when you buy uh, something specific, um, you are, uh, you're, you're, you have to be ready to, um, to wait long enough, right? Whereas if you have money, you're just, you're just ready for anything. And um, I defined money as uh, the most liquid good in the economy. So um, Bitcoin is not money by that definition, but that's where we want to take it. So um, now something I said a while back that confused people is that productivity today does not improve the value of Bitcoin. Um, it's, it's always about future productivity. So if you're, if you're spending Bitcoin, that means that you don't want as much Bitcoin. So you're, you're, you're bidding it down, uh, essentially, if you're spending now. So when I talked about that in the past, um, some, some people uh, some people use that to get the BTC cult started. And they believed that they could have a form of money that, um, that's not good for spending. But if you think about it, if you have a money, well, I mean, you can't call it money. That doesn't make any sense. But if you have some form of money that's not good for spending, then it doesn't have any future productivity because nobody's going to want to uh, offer something in exchange for it. Um, mo money is always about different, different times competing with one another. Uh, that's kind of what, um, what, what it enables people to, uh, people to do. It, Daniel, it can, I, can I just yeah. uh, interrupt uh, briefly here, just I think for the sake of, you know, uh, any yeah, stop new... me at any, any time if you have anything, please. Yeah, this is just, it's kind of a, a slight tangent, but I think it'd be useful. It's just for the sake of any new people watching the video, we haven't really, haven't really discussed what is Bitcoin because you mentioned the BTC cult briefly. And when we talk about Bitcoin, we're usually talking about Bitcoin SV. Do you want to just maybe briefly for the sake of anybody who may not actually know the difference, like what, what is the difference for, for them? Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, good, yeah, good point. So, um, um, when, when, when Bitcoin came out, the, um, the, the white paper and the original implementation were not enough to communicate what is essential about Bitcoin. And, uh, ba basically the majority of people who got into Bitcoin came in with uh, completely wrong ideas about it. And Bitcoin just works so well that the price still went up a lot anyway. And, um, um, and 
so the um, like a, a, a an incipient economy in Bitcoin got started, even though most of the people in it didn't know what they were doing. And so when the price went up, everybody who bought Bitcoin for whatever crazy reason they had was, was convinced that they bought it for the right reasons. So um, we ended up having a, um, a, an ideological conflict in Bitcoin that's based on uh, what, what, what is valuable about Bitcoin. And the, um, the BTC cult have, um, they, they uh, so the original ticker symbol of Bitcoin was, was BTC. And um, the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 group, the group of people who are now, uh, now in what, what's now called BTC, uh, they attempted to take over Bitcoin using methods that um, that are are not uh, not not conducive to increasing the value. They 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 took over with the idea that um, that. Uh, that they, it's like they just wanted power. They wanted power over Bitcoin. Um, but that won't really work because in order for Bitcoin to grow, it has to make things better for people. So people have to benefit from uh, engaging in the Bitcoin economy. And if somebody is trying to exert power over it, that just means that uh, people won't benefit. So they, they will just lose eventually. So what, what happened is that um, some, some people in Bitcoin uh, believed that it, it would be bad for the Bitcoin network to have a high bandwidth. In other words, it, that it would be bad for Bitcoin to be able to process lots of transactions. And um, uh, long ago, um, Satoshi put in a block size limit of one megabyte. And uh, he apparently assumed that everybody would understand that that is supposed to be a temporary measure that, um, that we would want to get rid of eventually. And it was there uh, because um, uh, the, uh, the computers on the network uh, were potentially vulnerable to um, uh, being, uh, being uh, to um, crashing if they were all, uh, if they would all attempt to process a very large block at the same time. So, um, so we didn't want, we wouldn't want all of the computers on the network to crash at the same time. So Satoshi put in a, a one megabyte block size limit because of that. But what the, um, the, uh, the small blockers wanted was to leave the one megabyte block size limit in permanently. And, um, uh, what, what that means is that either there are a, a very small number of people using Bitcoin or um, uh, the fees are very, very high to use Bitcoin. And neither of those, both of those mean that there's no future productivity. Because um, if you don't have very many people, then they won't be able to produce very much. And one of the things that money does is it enables people to specialize. So it's, it's really no good if we have a really tiny economy with only a few people because they can't specialize as much. And it's also no good if people have to pay high fees to use the coin because they just won't, they just won't do that. Like, 
anyway, so the way that the BTC cult took over was by colluding with exchanges and scamming miners, essentially. So they came up with this thing called a uh, user activated soft fork. And um, the majority of miners on the network um, didn't understand that uh, they don't need to pay attention to the user activated soft fork. And what that does is it basically says that um, you're, if you're running a, uh, a non-mining node, you start rejecting blocks that do not, uh, um, well, I don't remember exactly how it works, but they, they wanted to implement this thing called SegWit. And if uh, miners tried to make blocks that don't use SegWit, the, um, the user activated soft fork would reject them. And um, so I don't know what was going on with, uh, with most of the miners around then, but uh, for some reason they got fooled by this, even though the non-SegWit version of Bitcoin with, with big blocks is uh, the, the only way that they're going to be able to have an income in the future. But um, most most people who got into Bitcoin just didn't understand it well enough to know what their their best choices are. Um, so after this SegWit thing happened, we went through a process where people who basically got it had to sort of figure out who they all are and and find one another. And that's sort of what's happened in BSV is the the people who aren't totally clueless have all kind of congregated together and are now uh, attempting to create future productivity. Do, do you agree with that? Does that? Do you think that that story makes sense? I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Let, let me just describe what I think you're saying in, in my own words and see, see if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly. So first of all, in the BTC world, um, they, they seem to have gotten wrong the idea of more future productivity. So yeah. by artificially throttling the transaction volume, if we were to actually try to use BTC as money, we would have a terribly unproductive uh, world, effectively. Is that, is that accurate? Right. Okay. Well, I mean, we would just use dollars. Yeah, we so, just wouldn't. It just can't, yeah. I mean, it'd be, it would be so ridiculous. You just can't, you can't use it as money. Um, yeah. And so then the other thing, though, but, but they did get something right, I think, though. So what about the lower time preference? Because what they, what they got right is they all hodl. Right. So they all uh, they save in it. Isn't that a good thing? I mean, it, it, you know, what what is what is the difference there? So it sounds like, you know, based on what you're telling me and, and trying to think through everything you're saying, BTC uh, does not have the more future productivity, but they do have the lower time preference. I think BSV has both of them. But what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, I mean, in a sense, I, I, I think that um, that you're I mean, yeah, there's there's a sense in, in which you're right, I, I guess, but there's no reason to hodl if there's no future productivity. Um, and so I see the, um, the BTC people as being um, mostly people who are conned. Yeah, and, I, here, I, I've got a good way to express it. Let me, let me try and say what I think, I think the answer here. I mean, basically, it's the difference between being like, the reason why they have lower time preference is over like a misbelief about what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. So they think that um, the, the, basically what they think is that institutions are going to come in and buy a bunch of this stuff and send the price, you know, tenfold higher. That's yeah, what they uh, think <laughs> is going to happen. Why that's going to happen. I don't think they have a good idea. And yeah, the, okay. Well, let me, let me say something about that too, because <laughs> so much of the BTC dogma comes from me and it's very embarrassing. <laughs> I don't blame myself because what I've learned is that they would have just taken anything that I said, no matter what it was and screwed it up. Cause the, the ultimately there's, there's um, con artists behind everything who are trying to manipulate, manipulate people. I mean, I wish I had 
said things a little bit better in the past, but I just didn't understand how much people could be deceived. Um, so the investor thing, like I was, I started trying to tell people that Bitcoin needs to be for the investors a while back because this BTC, because of what I said about power and control earlier. Uh, and I was trying to tell people that, um, that power and, and control doesn't work because that's bad for the in investors. And so to me, an investor means someone who is uh, um, taking risk now on the basis of his future predictions. So, um, so if you think like whichever, whichever coin you think is going to be more valuable in the future, when you buy some of it or, or uh, get some of it somehow, um, you're, you're making an investment and on the basis of your prediction that it's going to be more valuable. And you're taking risk because there's a chance that it could be less valuable in the future. So that's what an investor means to me. But they, they twisted that too. They, they think that investor means institutional money. Um, but like if, if, there's no, if there's no future productivity, there's no reason to have the money. Oh, and let's talk about the network effect too, because that's another thing that I, that I talked about in the past that they screwed up. <laughs> so um, money is a way for a group of investors to invest in one another. Because remember I said a specialization earlier, money allows people to specialize. So if you're invested in the money, that means eventually you're going to get more out of what the other investors are going to produce. So there's a, a network effect with money. And if the network is bigger, that means you're, you're, getting, you're getting more out of it uh, in, in the future. If, if the network is going to be bigger in the future, then it's, it's better to have some of the money now um, because big, a bigger network means more, more specialization and more is going to be produced. So BTC has an, a network effect because they, uh, they took over the, the BTC ticker symbol and, um, and uh, bit before when Bitcoin was BTC, that was, it was the biggest cryptocurrency. So it had the biggest network effect. So they attempted to, to steal this network effect by getting all of the, uh, the exchanges to agree that SegWit coin is listed as BTC. Um, but they still have a network that doesn't produce anything or, and that can't produce anything. Um, and so, uh, so they have, they have a network effect but there's no reason for any of them to be a part of that network. And um, even if some of them started figuring out that things aren't working very well in BTC, they're still never going to improve because anybody who starts to, to understand what's wrong, it's the, their best decision is just to sell BTC and buy BSV. So, um, so what will happen is people who are uh, less conned will just leave and BTC will just grow on average less and less intelligent as time goes on. Um, so um, what's, what, what I think is really going on with money is that um, productivity today does not improve the value today, uh, but it did improve the value yesterday. And it's not that the future magically affects the past. What's really going on is we are all in a future prediction contest. And the person who, who uh, 
predicts the, the productivity of the economy better than, uh, than everyone else will get to buy more stuff in the future. So we're all in a contest to predict future productivity and we're all trying to assess what's, what's going to be produced. And when there's, when there's more future productivity, then uh, that's, that's when, well, specifically when, there, when you think there's more future productivity than other people think, then that's, that means that Bitcoin is undervalued. So you would want to buy more but if there's less, then it's overvalued and you'd want to spend more now. And the mere fact that productivity today doesn't improve value today is not a reason not to have productivity because future productivity must eventually become present productivity. Uh, so B BTC is really a network of people just sitting around doing nothing and not just manipulating people into believing that they are valuable when they're really not. And that's my definition of a cult. So, um, so they're, they're a cult because they want people to believe that they're valuable without actually doing anything that's valuable. But anyway, they'll, they'll all be gone pretty soon anyway. So, so whatever. <laughs> And we, last time we also talked about velocity. So that's, that's a similar idea. Um, well, I, I already said it. I just didn't use the word velocity because I don't like that word in, in the context of money. But uh, there could be like v v velocity of money does not drive price of money. Um, you would expect in a, in a healthy economy, you would expect velocity to go up with with the price, but you can also have uh, a, a trick where there's uh, a lot of coins being moved, but there isn't anything, uh, anything good being produced with them. So that's kind of what we had with the housing bubble in uh, the dollar, well, in the, the world economy uh, a while back, just about when Bitcoin was getting started. So we had lots of, um, Lots of uh, lots of trade in um, in housing, but it was unsustainable. So eventually, there was a there was a crash. Um, okay, great. Um, so um, So this slide is about um, why fixed supply is better than inflation. And this is another thing that, well, this is about how people have been, uh, been conned in the, uh, the fiat economy as opposed to the BTC economy. Because to me, this is another thing that it's, it's hard for me to understand how people can believe that um, that an, an increasing supply of money is is better, um, but lots of people do. This it shouldn't be that hard to understand. But um, if the supply of money can increase, that means somebody gets the new money first before everybody else, and that means they can buy stuff with it without having done anything to earn it. Excuse me. So if we have a, an increasing supply, uh, that's like there's, um, there's a parasite on the economy that's, uh, that's always sucking value out of it. And um, there isn't, um, there isn't a, a benefit from having a, um, a, uh, a fixed value of money. And this is something that, that people will say if you talk to them about uh, um, inflating the supply, they say that 
money is supposed to be a measure of value, and so it has to stay the same value. And I, I disagree with that because if the value of the money changes um, based on the rest of the economy, then that creates a much bigger incentive for everybody in the economy to try to predict the economy. So remember I said earlier, we're all in a future productivity contest and the one who does the best job of it gets to buy the most later. So if there is a, um, a, uh, a, a policy by the issuer of the money to try to keep the value fixed, then effectively what you have is the, the issuer is the only one with a reason to predict future productivity. Um, but it's much better if everybody's trying to predict it uh, because then, um, then everybody is, uh, everybody is uh, aligning their, their activity now more closely to what everybody else is doing. So there's more, there's more coordination. So um, fixed supply is going to be more attractive to people who like to think farther out into the future. So people who are more future oriented. Because if, if you like to think, because it's, it's just a way to benefit more from a farther out future. Because if your, your option is um, money that's going to inflate and become less valuable over time, you, you can't, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter if you know, if you know about the future. You, you don't have a way to benefit from the future as much with the, with the inflating money. But if you have the fixed supply money, when you, when you have some, you always retain the same fraction of the economy. So farther out futures become relatively more important. And so what I think will happen with Bitcoin is Bitcoin is going to attract the better future planners out of the fiat economy. And I call this the brain drain because what it eventually means is that the, the Bitcoin economy is going to be uh, built in, in a way that's sort of um, that's where that's 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 based more more based on the real future. So it's going to be a more a more realistic uh, growth plan, right? Um, everything everything that's happening now is going to be more uh, uh, more. Um, more connected to the, the real future than in the dollar economy. And as this effect progresses, um, the dollar or the fiat economies are going to become less future oriented and more, more present oriented, whereas the, the Bitcoin economy is going to be ready for the real future. So, um, the way to um, so the way the way to improve the value of bitcoins, we said the value is future productivity. So if you if you have bitcoins, you want to improve their value uh, naturally. The way you do that is create future productivity. So that, that just means you need to sustainably get more Bitcoins. So you need to uh, have a, um, uh, you need to provide something that the Bitcoin economy needs over a long period of time so that you can be uh, reasonably certain that you're going to keep getting more Bitcoins. So I have uh, two suggestions at the bottom he uh, here. So most people who get into Bitcoin, um, I, I would guess, are sort of not 
not in a position to start a business or, uh, or, or join a Bitcoin business necessarily. But if you have a, a normal job and you keep your savings in Bitcoin, um, then that's, that's sustainably getting more Bitcoins. And then eventually, maybe you can get paid in Bitcoin for your job. But, but for now, it, like I think most people will, um, will, will not be able to get paid in Bitcoin, but they can, they can save in Bitcoins. But if you understand Bitcoin really well, then you, you start a, a business that, that serves the Bitcoin economy. Then you're getting, getting all of your income in Bitcoins. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So when everybody is um, trying to get more Bitcoins, th that, that means they're all kind of pushing each other up. So that's how, um, that's how people cooperate in Bitcoin is they're all trying to uh, figure out how to get more. So anyway, this is what you talk about, because you say every problem with Bitcoin can be solved with Bitcoin. So that's, that's what I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so uh, this, this first point here, profit in Austrian economics means that you net more money with some economic activity than you would have by loaning it out at the, the interest rate. That's kind of a, an esoteric point, but um, there is, there's a difference between uh, performing an activity that is already uh, known to produce value versus doing something new that people didn't know is valuable before. And in, in Austrian economics, we like to reserve the term profit for something that's new. Um, but there's always income available for doing, for doing old stuff as long as, uh, b because there's always a, a, a limited supply of labor. So um, if you, uh, if you have, uh, there's, well, not just labor, but, um, but there's, a, there's a limited amount of production that, that we can do. So if you have uh, um, some production process, uh, you, make, you can make uh, Bitcoins with that. But if it's, not, uh, if it's not something that nobody knew about before, then that's not profit. And ultimately, what you earn is based on the interest rate in, in equilibrium. Uh, because if you're not earning that, then more people, or if you're, if you're earning more than that, then eventually more people will sort of do, do what you're doing and that will, um, that will reduce the, the income that's possible with it. And when, when you earn profits, uh, what that means is you have opened up new, new modes of production. So when you uh, discover a new, a new method of production, then uh, then you earn you earn money that's based on knowing knowing more than other people, and um, eventually they're going to copy what you're doing. And then you go back to uh, earning an amount that's based on the uh, the overall interest rate. So when you when everybody is profit seeking, they're all looking for new, new methods of production. And that means that they're all going to try to find new ways of specializing. And they're all going to be um, uh, trying to contribute more to the economy. So this, this next point, um, people who profit seek in the same unit all share information about opportunity cost. So this is something 
that is uh, very important that a lot of people don't get. But when people are profit seeking in the same form of money, what that means is there's a like everybody wants different things, right? We talked about subjectivity last time, but when they're all using the same money, um, that means that there's a, um, a, an objective ranking of the value of all activities uh, that's, that's based on how much they can, uh, they can exchange value with one another. So some things are going to uh, be losses, and some things are going to produce profits. And everybody who's using the same money um, will all agree on what is profitable and what is a loss. And their activity is going to push uh, losses out of the economy. And they're all going to learn how to do things that, uh, that don't produce losses. But if they're not using the same form of money, they're not, they're not creating this ranking of, of profits and losses among themselves. And um, that's why I say each coin is a cooperative unit. Um, because it's, it's just not the same if you're talking about a trade between uh, one person who likes Bitcoin and somebody else who likes Litecoin, because they're not, they're not, uh, there, there isn't that same, uh, that same communication of uh, profits and, and losses with them. And, um, so altcoins and forks. This is something that I've been saying for a long time. Uh, every, every different form of money is in a zero sum competition with one another. So if you, if you have some form of money, there's really no reason that you would want anything that ever gets produced to be sold for, in exchange for any other kind of money. Um, cause a, as we said, the value of money is future productivity. So if, if there's more than one form of money, uh, that means some of the productivity of the world economy is going, is not, is not going to your form of money. You see what I mean? Um, so everybody would want everything in the future to be sold for their form of money. And um, what, what you need to do is correctly predict which form of money is going to be used by everybody in the future. Uh, you, don't want to, um, you don't want to just pick a form of money and then kind of uh, be, be permanently uh, wedded to it because you might, you might pick the wrong one. That's what happened in, in BTC. Um, it, it's sort of... You don't, you don't want to fall for the sunk cost fallacy. But um, um, but if, if people don't, don't know, then, then there's going to be this, this zero-sum competition between different forms of money. So, uh, and it's the same with altcoins and forks. And by a fork, I don't mean a fork of the Bitcoin code. I mean a, a split in the chain. Um, altcoins, they're, 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 all, they're all in a zero-sum competition, but there's a, a difference in the way the competition works. So altcoins are like starting over. Um, and so... Bit, like, um, I, I think there's a, a fundamental misunderstanding of the value of money if you start an altcoin and if you get into one. Because um, the, this value uh, uh, that comes from money is about people's ability to cooperate 
and their their ability to um, to find their specialization among everyone else. But that's not what you're doing when you start an altcoin. You're you're creating you're starting a whole new economy where people have to start that process over again instead of joining with the people who have already been doing it. And um, I think that people who, who start altcoins and who get involved with them don't understand this. Well, I think some people who start altcoins perhaps have some understanding of this, but they are, they, they are not, uh, they're starting the altcoin as a way to, uh, to scam other people who don't understand. Um, and when, when there's a split, that's a little different because we're talking about the same group of people um, in, in both sides of the split. So there's, um, there's uh, the, this, they're not, uh, they're not starting over from the beginning. What you're doing is giving the same, the same group of people two different options in terms of how, how they're able to find value from one another. So um, splits are less destructive than altcoins. Uh, I think, but what we what we would ideally want is figure out what's actually the best set of rules and then stick with them. And it's a very costly experiment to uh, to split and then use two different rule sets at the same time. And um, so, uh, unfortunately, we've had. Uh, problems in, in Bitcoin with, um, with people who, who don't, who just aren't, aren't concerned with the costs that they're imposing on people. And they're, uh, they're more, more concerned with, uh, being in control than, uh, than with deriving value from Bitcoin. And, uh, First, we had the BTC split, and then we had uh, the BCH split, and both of those worked kind of the same the same way. There was kind of a, uh, a an attempt to exert power over the network, and splitting was was really the only option for um, uh, for enabling people to to derive value from one another. So um, can I uh, just pause again and, and, and interject as sort of a comment and a question, which is just, I think part of this may be just motives. And I think that, you know, some of us like the idea of actually, uh, you know, like, like Bitcoin has the potential. This is kind of, this is my wording here, but I think Bitcoin has the potential to be world money. And I think that's like, a, it's sort of the big picture vision here that we're actually trying to create world money yeah and i'm not sure that most of the other altcoins even have that idea like they're they're whatever their motives are is something actually quite different like like the the reason why they don't either understand this or take these ideas seriously is because they're just trying to do something different like like either like you said like i think some of them are just outright scams just basically just trying to scam people uh and then who knows what the other ones are but but do you have any thoughts on that like uh, what the you know sort of motives and, and vision of what these altcoins are even trying to do yeah well um i i think that um there's a there's a, a range because i think that um for example i think light litecoin was started with the uh the the idea of drawing lots of people into the coin and then selling out. And I, I don't have proof that that's what Charlie Lee was thinking, but to me, that's how it looks like. But uh, like I, I would say that uh, Dogecoin is the most honest altcoin. And I think that that was started just kind of as a joke and people thought it was funny. And uh, that's that's how it got going. And I don't I don't see any 
anything particularly malicious about how that one got started. And I think it's the most honest because it's purely based on a meme. And um, to me, that's kind of what, what money is. It's a shared, it's a shared idea. And um, yeah, what, what we want with Bitcoin is for everybody in the world to share the idea that Bitcoin is money. And that's going to take a, a lot of convincing, but um, but it's also the only goal that really makes sense, in my opinion, because of this, this zero-sum competition between monies. And if you're going to enter a zero-sum competition, you need to be, like, you should be trying to win, because uh, if you're not, then that means you lose everything. Um, so, and to me, uh, BSV is where people are conscious about value. So I'm trying to I'm trying to raise more consciousness, but uh, with these talks, right? But already in BSV, people seem to have the 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 basic idea down. And there, I would say everybody in BSV who is doing anything is doing something that improves value instead of reduces value. And whereas all of the other coins are sort of developer-led projects, and uh, they're not coins where there's like um, an an economy where people are just getting in and without without being developers or or attempting to lead the project just kind of contributing stuff to it in order to get more out later and what what we want in bsv eventually is that everybody is acting that way so right now there are still some uh some people who are acting like uh like the leaders because there's a plan for changing the rules back to the uh, the original Satoshi vision. But what we want after that point is nobody is the leader and everybody is competing to contribute more value so that they can get more out later. So it's a, a game where everybody has... Um, uh, everybody is in the same position with regard to one another, and that's that's what's going to um, that's what's going to maximize value. Because when when people try to act like uh, like leaders too much, what they end up doing is interfering with everybody else, and that's that's what the problem of socialism is. If you've read uh, Ludwig von Mises. Um, the, the cost of a, a centrally planned socialist economy is that everybody in the economy has to spend a lot of time and effort going along with what the leaders are doing. Whereas if we have a, a system where, um, where, where everybody can act independently, then, then everybody can uh, derive much more value from everybody else because everybody can sort of add value in a way that's not interfering with uh, with with other people. Do, do you agree with that? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, uh, with respect to what Mises' view is, I, I I mean, what I was thinking as you're saying that is, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I don't know Mises well enough to comment on, on Mises, but I mean, the, the idea that, uh, uh, the, you know, a difference with an economy where people are sort of independent is that they have knowledge uh, that, that the central planners don't have. I think that might come from Hayek is where that idea comes from. That's kind of yeah. how I think about the fundamental sort of, uh, sort of efficiency difference between an economy with independent agents versus a central planner. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's talk about Mises versus Hayek real quick. Um, so, yeah, um, what, what Mises said is that central planning destroys 
the, the profit seeking mechanism. And people's ability to seek profit has to do with their, their specialized knowledge. And um, um, uh, so Hayek wrote a lot of important stuff about this topic. So for example, he wrote the use of knowledge in society. And that's, that's a really important essay, but he didn't seem to fully understand what Mises was saying because what Hayek emphasized was the cost of centralizing all knowledge. But there's, um, there's a point missing there about that, I think, and, and that is that not all knowledge can be effectively transmitted. So if you, well, you are an entrepreneur. I was going to say if you're an entrepreneur, but that is what you are. <laughs> so um, your, your ideas about what is going to make your, your business profitable are not necessarily things that are easy to convince other people. And they're not necessarily things that a central planner would think about or, or know about. And um, because you take your own risk when you're an entrepreneur, that means that you don't, you don't have to convince anybody because you're, you're putting your own money on the line. And if you're, if you're interacting with the, uh, the central planners, you don't, you don't have that option. You, um, they have to know what you know in order to get it right. And there isn't any reason that they necessarily would know that. And you know, from an outside perspective, we don't know which entre entrepreneurs are going to make profits and which ones are going to make losses. What we have with the, the capitalist economy is that the, the good ideas win out and benefit everybody else and the bad ideas die out quickly. And there, there isn't anything like that in uh, the centrally planned economy. And it's very easy for bad ideas to win in central planning. Okay, so this next part is gonna be a little embarrassing because um, I thought that I had a lot more to this presentation. Um, so last time I was like, oh, we're about half done, <laughs> but I only had a couple slides left. But what actually happened is that I had uh, outlines for lots of other stuff that I forgot just wasn't in the presentation. So now we're, we're just gonna have the, uh, the end slide for a while, but I, but I actually still have quite a bit more uh, more to go over. Okay. Um, so this last section is on uh, the, the origin of money. And that's important because, well, it's, it's about the, the origin and growth of money. And um, what's, uh, what's important about the, the origin is that um, where, where we are now, has to do with where we were in the past. And that's the only way that, that money can work uh, because the money necessarily has, um, it, it is what everybody thinks it is. And in order for money to grow, people's minds need to, to change. And there needs to be a, a, a shared idea that, that grows to include everybody. And that's not the same as, um, as like a, a, a machine or something that where the, the value is just what, what it can do, you know, right now a, a, as it is. It's really like Bitcoin is like a machine that that changes as people change their ideas about it. So if, as people join the Bitcoin economy and they change from being dollar profit seekers to 
Bitcoin profit seekers, that changes the value of the, the Bitcoin machine because they become part of it. And um, the, the, the Bitcoin, the monetary unit is, is just an, it's an imaginary good that we can all re remember uh, reliably what, what we all have of it. And um, in order for this, this value to grow, we have to, uh, it, it has to, um, has to grow from, from where it is now. It has to change from a, um, an idea that, that people don't believe in to an idea that people do believe in. So in Austrian economics, the, the origin of money uh, in the, the theory of the origin money, uh, the origin of money is, um, ex is explained by an idea called the regression theorem. And um, the regression theorem says that the, the, um, there must have been a, a, an original value of the money good that's different from its value as money. And um, in other words, people needed to have a, whatever good people use as money now, they needed to have a reason to value it um, before, before it was money. Otherwise it wouldn't be able to become money. Because if somebody is thinking of, of using something as money, they have to have a, a reason to imagine that uh, somebody is going to want to exchange something for it in the future. And that reason um, doesn't have to do with, with money because we're, we're, by hypothesis, we're talking about the, the first person who started thinking of the good as money. So, um, so for example, uh, gold was money, but before gold was money, it was good for, for showing off. Um, and you could, pe people could expect that it would maintain value, um, because, um, uh, if, if you had some, everybody knew that you were wealthy and that's, that's useful. So that's not, I should say, that's my theory about why gold is value, valuable, but that, that may not be what really, really happened with gold. That when, 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 we, um, when we talk about these ideas in Austrian economics, what, what we're really doing is, is thought experiments. So when I'm talking about the origin of money, um, I, I, I'm not claiming to know a lot about the real history because of that. But what we want to do is explain is, is explain value by thinking about a, 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 an imaginary time where people are not using money and trying to explain how that would turn into um, turn into a society where they, they are using money. So in, in, in my notes, I mention a book called Debt, the first 5,000 years or 6,000 years or something, I don't remember. Um, and this book says that the Austrians don't know what they're talking about because money did not arise out of a barter system. He says instead that um, money started because of a, a debt system that, uh, that the, um, the, uh, the governments of early civilizations uh, started using with their, um, with their peasants and so on. Um, so my, my answer to that is uh, a, a debt system is still, it's still a barter system because debt is just a good 
at a different time. When, when we're exchanging debts, what we're doing is we're, we're exchanging goods that exist at different times. So uh, I, I don't agree that the, the, um, the book Debt proves that the Austrian theory is wrong. Uh, I think it, it just proves that um, you don't, you can't learn about the details of, of real history by doing thought experiments. But the, the thought experiment is still correct. It's, it's just that um, uh, the, um, the, uh, the way that Austrians were originally thinking about it is, uh, may have been different from the, uh, um, it, 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 abs it's abstracted away from the real situation. So Can I give my own view of what I think you're saying and, and just it's sort of in different words, which is basically there's a sort of narrative about what happened. And it's not about the details about exactly how gold became money or something like this. It's about the ideas that, uh, you know, allow something like gold to become money. But the details about what actually happened in reality, well, those are details that are, that are in, the, in the realm of history. Like how do we go in and figure out what actually happened? And it ought to align with the Austrian ideas. Um, but you know, there's no way to know the details without doing that uh, difficult and perhaps impossible historical analysis. The, yeah, exactly. The, the, right. So there's really very little content to Austrian economics. And that's kind of why, uh, well, to me, that's a, good, that's a good thing about it. Because I don't think there really is that much you can say from a totally a priori, uh, you know, thought experiment basis. But I think that Austrians confine themselves to, to saying things that, um, that must apply to any historical situation. And they don't, uh, they, the reason they can get it right is because they don't say very much. So the regression theorem in Austrian economics just says that there must be an earlier value to the money good before it's used as money. But I think Bitcoin does some kind of weird, weird things with this idea. But anyway, I was, I was giving examples and then, then I went off track a little bit. But so gold, uh, gold has an original value because you can use it to show off that you're wealthy because it's scarce and it's also easy to identify. So somebody who is thinking about being a, uh, a merchant or doing some kind of trading, he might want to get some gold, not because he wants to show off that he's wealthy, but because he wants to trade it in the future and he doesn't know, he doesn't know exactly what he wants yet. So then he's using it as savings instead of for showing off. And the, the dollar has an original value as well, and that is that the dollar was originally backed by gold. Um, there, there was kind of a uh, scam that went on in the, uh, over the course of the 20th century where they kind of pulled the rug out from under the dollar investors, and they gradually changed the nature of the dollar so that it is no longer backed by gold. But once the dollar was used as money, then it doesn't need to have that, that original value in order to be, um, to be money. Now, um, if we had a perfectly, um, uh, perfectly um, uh, reputable central bankers who would never never abuse their privilege, then the dollar would be perfectly good money, I think, even though it doesn't have this original value anymore. But I don't think that it's reasonable to, um, to expect that the central bankers will, uh, will, will manage the, the money very well over the long term. Um, so um, there's kind of a, 
a problem with thinking about the original value of Bitcoin because it doesn't seem like Bitcoin is good for anything other than as money. So uh, I'm going to give give some of my my answers for the uh, the original value, and I've got I've got two two different answers. Um, the first one is, uh, and well, and they both they both involve the uh, the use of hash power as a, a way of of getting that original value. So my my first answer is when when we were talking about the the original value before what I said is by hypothesis we're talking about the first person to originally use a good as money so there's kind of a way of getting around the regression theorem if you just say that more than one people more than more than one person starts using a good as money at the same time then you've got kind of a weird problem with the coincidence of it because they would they would all have to start getting this this good in order to spend it later um not knowing that there's anybody else around who's doing the same thing but bitcoin gets around that because you can see that people are trying to get bitcoin because of hash power so because you can evaluate the, uh, the energy that's lost to mine the original Bitcoins, you can have a, a bunch of people who know at the same time that other people are acquiring Bitcoins for use as money. So um, I think that that, in, in a way that that kind of gets around the regression theorem, I think, but there there's another way of thinking about this because you can say like if you can see that somebody else is spending energy to get bitcoins, that means that you all you already know that you can use bitcoins as money because you can find that original first miner and uh offer him a better value for Bitcoins. So if you get Bitcoins, and you know somebody is spending a certain amount of energy to get them, you just offer him a better deal and he'll do something other than mining for you, for those Bitcoins that you have. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, um, um, oh, so for my last point is I'm going to talk about um, what Rothbard says in Man, Economy, and State that suggests that Bitcoin is impossible. So remember, I'm, I'm recommending Man, Economy, and State as uh, the best place to get started in Austrian economics. And in particular, I think he has the best theory of money. Um, not that he, he disagrees with any of these other people, but he just kind of puts all of the information together and explains it all very well. And I think his, his version, his theory of money is the, the clearest and easiest to understand. Um, but he says that a, a new form of money cannot beat an old form of money because of the network effect. So the old, an old form of money that's used by everybody in an economy is better than some new form of money that only a few people use. And he says that the new form of money cannot defeat the old form because of that. But um, uh, he, he was still thinking of money as commodity money. So, he was thinking of the new form of money as like if a bunch of people started trying to use gold as money and tried to compete with the dollar with it. Um, but he wasn't thinking about 
a new form of money that has other services attached to it, which is what Bitcoin is. Um, and so what, what Bitcoin can do that uh, you can't do with gold is it can do, um, can do all sorts of things that people need without them having to use Bitcoin as money other than to make, uh, make tiny payments with it to miners. So for example, we can put um, dollar denominated tokens on Bitcoin, and then we can do dollar transactions on Bitcoin, which is something that the whole banking system needs. And then they're not, they don't have to use Bitcoin as money other than getting tiny amounts to make whatever transactions they need. And they're getting, they're deriving value out of the network um, that they can't get with dollars the way they are now. So Rothbard missed that uh, in Man, Economy, and State, I think. And not, that's, just, that's just an example of how people can derive value from the Bitcoin network. Um, and that, what that means is that people who use Bitcoin as money can provide services to, to people who don't use Bitcoin as money. That makes the Bitcoin economy sustainable, even if the network effect is not as good as the dollar. Excuse me. So, so what we want with Bitcoin is for the Bitcoin network as it is now to become a sustainable source of value. And um, we also want more, more people to join the Bitcoin economy and to become Bitcoin profit seekers because that will make it more efficient. That'll make Bitcoin better money. Those are two different things that um, can happen uh, separately from one another. But they, uh, they both, um, uh, there's, there's a synergy between them because they both act to, um, to improve the Bitcoin network. And as the network provides more services, that creates more reasons for people to want to join. Um, oh, so since we're talking about the, uh, the value of Bitcoin specifically, I, I guess I'll conclude with a few more reasons that um, Bitcoin is a good idea that don't have to do with the, the original Austrian theory of money. So um, what, what we talked about in, in this uh, this discussion and the previous one is mostly the, the, the Austrian theory that came before Bitcoin. But Bitcoin adds a lot um, that, that wasn't part of the, the content of the original theory. And I think uh, in, in particular, so we talked about fixed supply, but in particular, I think that there are two more things that Bitcoin does that the previous Austrians didn't think about. And um, one of them is hash power. And we didn't, uh, we talked a little bit about that, but there's something that hash power does that other forms of money don't, can't, can't do. And that is that people who use Bitcoin as money can estimate the overall size of the total economy by the hash power, or at least they will after the subsidy is, uh, is smaller than, um, than, the, um, than the, the hash power that's going to processing transaction fees. And that's not something that people who use dollars have. And they have to, um, people who use dollars have to rely on uh, measures of the size of the economy that can be faked and which I think are 
just inherently deceptive. So I, I don't think that, that GDP is a very good way of measuring the size of the economy, but that's what people who use dollars have to rely on. And uh, whereas uh, I think people in Bitcoin have a much better way of estimating the size of the economy and because they can look at hash power and that's going to be proportional to the overall size, not over long times, but in, in the short term, there, there's going to be a, a proportionality between hash power and the economy. And that means that it's more difficult to deceive people about when it's a good time to invest in the economy. And what we've seen um, a lot with the fiat economies is there's these, uh, these big um, economic cycles where uh, everything uh, goes up a lot and then it, then it crashes a lot. I guess we've seen stuff a lot worse than that in, in Bitcoin. But that has to do with um, uh, people learning about uh, how many new people are sort of joining the economy. So lots of people join and then the price goes up a lot. And then they all sort of realize that they don't know, they don't know what to do. So then, then the price goes down a lot. But Bitcoin, in, when Bitcoin is at scale, that will be moderated and the ability to deceive people about the size of the economy will be a lot less. Right, right now, there's a lot of uncertainty about the size of the Bitcoin economy because it's possible for lots and lots of people to join it at the same time. Um, so there's hash power. And then the other thing is the, uh, the, the public nature of Bitcoin transactions. And um, what, what we get from that is um, Bitcoin is uh, it's a bad idea to steal Bitcoin or it's a worse, worse idea to steal Bitcoin than dollars because the, uh, the evidence that's left when you steal Bitcoin is a lot worse than for dollars in general. And another thing you get from that is people can use the Bitcoin network to communicate with one another. So remember I was talking about earlier how we're all in sort of a, a future productivity uh, projection contest. And whoever does the best gets to spend the most later. But what you can do with Bitcoin is if you, 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 can, you can transmit your superior knowledge through the Bitcoin network um, after you've already prepared to benefit from it. So if you, if you think that there's more future productivity in Bitcoin than other people realize, that means, that, remember that means we said that means you want to buy more. Um, what you can do after that is tell everybody else why there's more future productivity in Bitcoin than, than they were thinking before. And you can use the Bitcoin network to tell people because you know they're all going to be looking at it. And um, that means that um, there's, a, a more, there's more cooperation, not just in um, how, how we all produce, but in how we, uh, we predict the future of Bitcoin. So there's, there's a future, uh, future production projection contest, but it's also more cooperative than in dollars. And um, so, um, um, well, I was talking to somebody about the simulation hypothesis the other day. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude with that. Uh, and so I, I'll just say what I think is that people in the future, that I, I'm, I, what I'm going to say is that what you want to simulate is the future. So the idea of the simulation hypothesis is that people in the future 
simulate the past and then it's more likely that we are one of those past simulations than the real past. And I think, I think that that's a kind of a silly idea because what you want to simulate is the future. And so uh, are, are we in a simulation? Uh, and I'm, I'm going to say yes, but it's, it's our simulation of our own future. And that's what, what Bitcoin enables us to do. Okay, very interesting. I actually have a totally different uh, perspective on the simulation thing. Oh, Maybe okay. Just, just briefly share. It's, it's a bit off topic, but it's uh, just because you brought it up. Because um, I, I too, am, I, I don't really like the idea of the, the simulation hypothesis. I, I think it's a, a bad idea because I think they're doing Bayesian probability theory wrongly in the following way. The idea is to have a, you know, let's try and predict the probability that we are in a simulation. But what they do is they take things that they've inferred about the world as being more basic than the reality in which we live. So they do things like take our knowledge of history as some type of starting point and saying that, oh, this looks like it's very improbable. And I think that the basic error is that you, you can't start with those things. You can't start with things like um, these, these external facts about the world that you've inferred because you've actually started from where you are. In order to derive those facts, you've had to start from your knowledge of your surroundings. And you basically have to assume that this is real in order to do that. that that's so, a really good point. No, yeah, I agree with that. That makes sense. I mean, if we are in a simulation, then we couldn't really infer anything in general about our knowledge of history because that would all be nonsense. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So yeah, that's my best argument against the, uh, the simulation uh, hypothesis. Um, so yeah, look, this was really, really interesting, Daniel. I mean, this is a, a, a really great information, I think, for people to watch us. I, I learned a lot listening to you talk about these things. I mean, this is, a, um, I'll have to go continue my studies of uh, Austrian economics and read some of the books that you've referenced. Um, yeah, any, uh, any, any closing thoughts on, uh, on all this uh, material? Um, um, just, um, well, just you know, do do your own research. Like I'm, I am recommending the Austrian theory, but um, like the way, well, just what I said at the beginning. The, the you you want to have superior knowledge. So um, once Austrian economics becomes standard knowledge in Bitcoin, then it's going to become less useful. So um, I, I think it's it's really important. But the best knowledge is. Uh, what doesn't uh, what doesn't come to you easily. So um, I, I read all of these Austrian books before I had the idea that they were, it, it, it was going to be worth money to understand this stuff. Because I just wanted to understand how the world works. And to me, the Austrians were, they were, they, they were thinking, in a way that's that's realistic uh, about the world, and um, the 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 mainstream economy economics I see as more of a, a mishmash, where they're because they're not thinking like scientists, there isn't the same process as in science of bad ideas getting rejected more often than, than good ideas. Um, um, but when once, uh, well, eventually, like all knowledge becomes relevant to valuing Bitcoin uh, because um, you're, you're really talking about the whole, the whole economy. And, um, and I think economics is a, a big part that has been been missing from the, the way people have been thinking about Bitcoin in, in the past quite a bit. Um, uh, but but ultimately, um, what's going to be the most beneficial is the knowledge that uh, that you have that other people don't have. See, because I had the opportunity to buy Bitcoin before I gave this talk. See what I mean? 
In fact, this is just kind of what I was talking about before, because I'm telling people how to value Bitcoin better. <laughs> Great. Yeah, you're, so you're helping. Yeah. So, so, a, uh, uh, so, so maybe a takeaway is something like, I like what you're saying about, you know, basically people should really study this stuff themselves and really try to understand things. Um, and they should, they, should, they should act the way that the Austrians act, which is like they're really trying to understand what's going on in the world. And that pretty much means acting like a scientist. Yeah, well, I think, um, well, as, as you remember from our, our last discussion, I criticized the Austrians for being, for not, not wanting to be entrepreneurs. So I think that um, a, a good Bitcoiner is someone who is a, a, a rationalist in the Austrian sense, but who is also an entrepreneur and who wants to, to take, take risk on the basis of their knowledge. Because I think that the, um, the modern Austrians have missed, missed an opportunity with Bitcoin that their, their knowledge should have been enough to, to tell them that, that they had. They, but they didn't. They didn't want it, and uh, to me, that's uh, that's there's there's something there's something crazy about that. And what I I attributed this to their that, that the modern Austrians seem like they want to be rationalist about everything. Okay, so not just be a scientist, then also be an entrepreneur. Yeah. 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 I think that. Um, in in the past, uh, yeah, Bitcoin just kind of creates this this opportunity for economists to be entrepreneurs. So before, like, you had to start um, a business to be an entrepreneur. That was kind of the idea. But I think that if you're just um, just understanding the 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 economics of Bitcoin and understanding the Bitcoin economy is uh, is being being an entrepreneur, and um, if if you understand it well enough, you can do you can focus on on that. See what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, Daniel. I mean, this has been a, a fantastic talk. I think we're going to do more talks in the future. Um, certainly, I would be interested if, if you want to, and we can uh, continue on. I think we. we I, I don't want to mention subjects. Maybe we can discuss privately if we want to continue other subjects. But uh, what, what do you think? Should we should we continue and do other stuff? Uh, yes, I, I want to continue, and and I think that if you, um, uh, I I think that we've gone over the in our, our we've done three talks so far, and I think we've we've gone over some of the most important aspects of, of Bitcoin in them, but we're never going to run out of material. <laughs> yeah. So I'm looking forward to whatever we decide to do next. And I don't know what, what that's going to be, but um, well, I'm just, I'm just glad that people are interested in what I have to say now, because I, I didn't like it when, uh, when we had this, uh, this, this little cult problem recently in Bitcoin. So yeah. People, weren't interested in me yeah. for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. I mean, that, that, it's a sign that uh, we're, we are uh, you know, generating, uh, I guess I would say, an audience of people that are, uh, are taking ideas seriously and they're a little bit less cult-like than uh, some, of these, some of the other people in, like, in, like in BTC. So, yeah, um, and it's, I, much, it's better if people don't all agree on everything because that means that people are looking for value in, in different ways. And because we have this system where, where good ideas tend to win out, it's, it's good for people to, to disagree and uh, to, to uh, explore every possible avenue for deriving value. Yeah. All right, Daniel, thank you very much. Um, thank you.